try hard enough, it's possible to find a couple of obscure female artists working before the mid-19th century, but you won't find any female illustrators. Drawing and painting had long been encouraged as suitable pastimes for well-brought-up young ladies, but it was a man's world and making a living from artistic talent was pretty much out of the question. But despite this suppression, in 1867, two very different women managed to break free from their confinement. French-born Isabelle du Tessier used the pen name Marie Duval. She lived in London with her husband Charles Ross and together they created the comic anti-hero Ali Sloper. At the outset Duval inked Ross's sketches but within a couple of years she took over completely and was soon producing other cartoons and spot illustrations. Unfortunately she only lived to the age of 43 leaving behind a relatively small body of work. The delicate watercolour illustrations of Kate Greenaway also first appeared in 1867. A decade later, the success of her book Under the Window made her somewhat of a celebrity. Greenaway confined her subject matter to the female, young and genteel, and it was a formula which brought her considerable success. But not as much success as America's first significant female illustrator. Jessie Wilcox Smith had previously been a teacher and started illustrating quite late in life, but she made up for lost time with a large body of work and quickly became one of the highest paid illustrators of the period. Although not as narrow as Kate Greenaway in her choice of subjects, the majority of her watercolour illustrations were nevertheless directed at a female audience. And whether in magazines, advertising or books, her renditions of motherhood and childhood were what made her reputation. Wilcox Smith had been one of a group of women who had studied under the massively influential illustrator Howard Pyle. They went on to form a professional collective to further the interests of women in illustration and wider society. Both Elizabeth Shippen Green and Violet Oakley shared a studio with Wilcox Smith and both produced illustration of considerable merit, but they were overshadowed by Wilcox Smith's unprecedented popularity. And with a style remarkably similar to Wilcox Smith, Sarah Stilwell Webber also illustrated books and magazines with a strong female slant to her subject matter. It's likely that Rose O'Neill would have been somewhat of an also-ran had it not been for the Cupids. Her sentimental images of rotund, playful cherubs made their debut in 1909 in the Ladies' Home Journal, and before long they were seen just about everywhere. And the merchandising and dolls they spawned soon made O'Neill a multimillionaire. Eleanor Abbott's profile was nothing like as high, but she was arguably one of the most accomplished of the group. Her work for magazines and books featured exceptionally good figure work. It was always attractively composed, and a strong sense of romantic mystery pervades much of her output. The same could be said for Clara Peck, who worked across a wide range of printed media, using her distinctive medievalist linear style and strong design sense. But perhaps more significantly, like Marie Duval before her, she was also that rarest of creatures, a female comic strip artist. The last of Howard Pyle's group is Gertrude Kay. She started her career in 1908 with illustrations for the Ladies' Home Journal, and not long after also began illustrating children's books with even greater success. She created a particularly credible and attractive version of Alice in Wonderland. In the 1920s, Kay began to travel widely and her visits to the Far East had a clear stylistic impact on her later work. It would be hard to overstate the significance of British watercolour illustrator Beatrix Potter. Her earliest work was as a natural history artist, but her tale of Peter Rabbit was published in 1902 and was an instant critical and popular success. Over her career, 27 more followed. Potter was far from the first to anthropomorphise animals, but she did it with immense skill and believability due to her close observation of animal anatomy. 
Less well known is English illustrator Margaret Tarrant, who launched a career at the age of 20 with an edition of Charles Kingsley's The Water Babies. She followed this up with a series of fairy-themed books which display a talent for watercolour the equal of Beatrix Potter. One of remarkably few women of significance not from the USA or Britain was Dutch illustrator Nellie Boddenheim. Her illustrations were most frequently charming evocative silhouettes, but she also worked in colour on occasion, if perhaps not quite as distinctively. British illustrator Hilda Cowham was one of the first women artists to be published in Punch, but once again it was her children's illustration which made her reputation. Although more stylistically diverse than others, it was her cute child characters which were her most popular and led to a range of lucrative ceramics by Shelley Potteries. And her contemporary and friend Mabel Lucy Atwell was similarly popular for her cute images of children. Not only were they used to sell products on posters, but they were heavily merchandised with figurines, dolls and crockery for decades to follow. Mary Tortell had been a rather unremarkable children's illustrator for two decades before creating Rupert Bear for a children's strip in the Daily Express in 1920. The strips and the books they spawned were illustrated by Mary for the first 15 years of the character's existence before her failing eyesight forced her to hand the strip over to Alfred Bestall. During a remarkably prolific career starting in 1919, American Dorothy Lathrop illustrated 38 books by other authors in addition to nine of her own. Her first published collection appeared in Walter de la Mer's book The Three Muller Mulgars and she went on to illustrate five more of his books. Lathrop's style was less overtly representational than others. It was somewhat influenced by Art Deco styling and remarkably graceful and delicate whether in colour or monochrome. In 1928, Millions of Cats by Von der Gogh was first published and is now widely considered to be crucial in the development of the modern picture book format in its integration of story and image. Stylistically, this book and those that followed were a highly distinctive hybrid of European folk art and contemporary Art Deco design. She went on to create several others during her lifetime, such as The Funny Thing, The ABC Bunny, and the feminist-friendly Gone is Gone, the story of a man who wanted to do housework. American cartoonist Ethel Hayes was best known for the comic strips she drew throughout the 1920s and 30s. Her Deco-style work appeared in several papers and her biggest success was the series Flap of Fanny which she created in 1924. In her later career she left the rapid turnover of comic strip work behind and successfully repositioned herself as a children's illustrator with many books to her credit. Britain's Cicely Mary Barker's reputation rests entirely on her flower fairy illustrations. These charming watercolours first appeared in 1923 and several others were added to the series throughout the decades. Nothing, not even a date of birth, is known about French illustrator Madeleine Giraud, except that she was the only female illustrator to work for the otherwise exclusively male magazine Le Sourire and she's the only French woman illustrator of the earlier 20th century I could find. What little of her work can be found reveals a playful Art Deco sensibility and the light comic erotic touch. Joyce Mercer is another unknown quantity. We know she was born in England in 1896 and there's a reasonable amount of her work to be found online, but that's about it. This is a pity, as her particularly precise and aesthetically considered Art Deco styling make her one of the most distinctive illustrators of her time. Whether in black and white or colour, her work was invariably possessed of personality and visual appeal. As the only example of a female illustrator of Pulp Fiction, American Margaret Brundage is somewhat better known. Her engagingly lurid and overheated images featured from 1932 onwards on dozens of covers of Weird Tales magazine for more than a decade. 
Working in pastels, she was able to create exceptionally solid and dramatically lit visual melodramas, which were notorious for their overt erotic appeal. And perhaps even more significantly, in the very male world of pin-up art, there were three successful women artists. In 1941, Zoe Moser was first signed to a contract with calendar publishers Brown and Bigelow. In 1943, she moved to Hollywood, and while there, she painted movie posters. Most famous of these was a billboard for the Howard Hughes film The Outlaw, featuring Jane Russell at her most sexually alluring. Throughout her life, Moser continued to paint calendars for Brown and Bigelow and became one of the highest paid illustrators of the period, male or female. As a young woman, Joyce Ballantyne had been turned down by Disney, who told her women were a poor investment. So she worked at various commercial art studios, eventually meeting up with the then King of Pinups, Gil Elvgren. In 1945, he recommended her to Brown and Bigelow, for whom she produced several calendars. Her 1954 calendar was such a hit that it had to be reprinted multiple times, and this success led to work for men's magazines Esquire and Penthouse. Ballantyne also produced advertising work for clients such as Schlitz Beer and most famously Coppertone Suntan Cream. Pearl Frush was, and still is, the least well-known of the trio. She had set up her own advertising art studio in the early 40s, and from 1943 onward, she also produced several calendars for various publishers, including the ubiquitous Brown and Bigelow in the late 50s. She used various combinations of pastels, watercolour and gouache in her work, and she made her images distinctive with their comparative delicacy and dreamy atmosphere. By the 50s, Disney Studios had finally become more open to female artists, and that's where Mary Blair began her career in 1952. She worked as a concept artist on several Disney projects, such as Cinderella and Peter Pan, but little of her modernist style made it through to the finished films. In frustration, she struck out on her own and found success primarily as a children's illustrator, where her playful geometric style was accepted eagerly. Despite her abstracted approach, her images didn't lack emotion and were visually absorbing to young readers. And her remarkable body of work has proved to be a particularly strong influence on many later illustrators. And the last of our heroines is a less well-known, but in my view, equally significant modernist. Born in Holland in 1918, Jenny Dallenwood illustrated more than 180 children's books throughout her career. Her angular abstracted approach pushed illustration about as far from realism as it could go. Despite this, her illustrations are as eloquent as they are stylish, and given some of what we've seen earlier, refreshingly unsentimental. And now, half of all illustrators currently working are women. And it's thanks largely to the talent and determination of these women, and others like them, that attitudes have changed, and there's nothing the least bit unusual about being a female illustrator in the 21st century.